I thought I would in this brief video continue our discussion on the ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus, of whom I should note, although generally given less attention in academia, did serve as creating his own very own school of philosophy, very much in the same vein in which Plato and other philosophers did. More specifically, we make an introduction of sorts into Epicurus and his philosophical views related to freedom of the variety concerning the freedom of actions and the human will. So I recommend checking out my other videos on Epicurus that's going to give you some basic insight into his uh, hedonism and his uh, also his views on the suffering and, and death. And uh, it's important to note out that when we're talking about Epicureanism or Stoicism, we're really talking about a life uh, philosophy that uh, pertains to all domains of life. So you can't walk out the door without having something being said in terms of prescriptive uh, ethics or something or some philosophy concerning your day-to-day -day life uh, with these classical philosophies. But secondly, we might also discuss Epicureanism in relation to uh, a sort of a project that's been going on maybe the last uh, decade or two with really bringing in uh, ancient philosophies, uh, especially Stoicism, which is very popular, or Epicureanism, and tackling them in a sort of day-to-day -day life, like a, a reading in our own contemporary times, which is also an interesting project. And, uh, and by the way, this is how you should read like philosophy text in general. I mean, you should, there should be some kind of exegesis on the text itself, and then a reflection on if you are uh, re reflections at all changed. It's like a reflection on a reflection uh, to see if you your views changed uh, during the course of reading the text, and and it, and then furthermore relating it to to the previous point about uh, you really want to read the text in terms of how they were understood in their own times, and then try to adapt them into your own situation uh, in contemporary life. Although in a significant fashion, Epicurus is very much remembered for his espousal of his own brand of hedonism. He serves as the first philosopher that I am aware of that poses the modern philosophical dilemma of free will and offering up in turn his solution in terms of free will via libertarianism to the problem at hand. In addition, in a somewhat less important sense, uh, this should also be taken to encompass an important study of early Hellenistic philosophy pertaining to that of the Epicureans. Now, to those more unfamiliar with this philosophical position, free will is easily illustrated in the following diagram. To tackle the branches starting from the left, libertarian free will, not to be conflated with the political position, relates a view which espouses that there is in existence a freedom when making choices to do otherwise than if you had chosen in such a way that the option of choice was not predetermined when you made it. This position is also referred to as sometimes as indeterministic incompatibilism. Furthermore, this means that libertarians are in the camp of affirmation regarding free will, claiming that it both exists and that one is morally responsible for the actions which one takes. Some pertinent demonstrations that this position of free will will optimally have to account for include number one, giving an explication for the type of ability that constitutes being able to act in a different manner, and number two, giving a justification for why the ability described in number one is the right kind of ability to explain having a choice of a different action. This camp will also have to counter the notion that the universe operates according to deterministic laws where actions may be explained fully by antecedent conditions. Moving to the right in our table, Compatibilists or soft determinists may be thought of as a sort of hybrid between the position of affirming no free will and the free will held by libertarians. This branch thus aspires to redefine what it means to have free will in terms of, on the one hand, not having the option to have chosen otherwise when making a choice, but on the other hand, still maintaining freedom. This notion of freedom might be rendered difficult for a person affirming libertarian free will to intuit, but the compatibilist will respond by stating that although the action is inevitable following deterministic laws, the concept of freedom lies in the choice itself of performing an action in the absence of impediments, where we might add making the choice based upon wish or preference. 
This freedom of making choices in terms of inherent ability has been formulated by classical compatibilists as the following simple conditional analysis. An agent S has the ability to do otherwise if and only if were S to desire or prefer to choose otherwise than S would choose otherwise. From the above statement, the compatibilist will thus have to give a defense regarding this notion of freedom being very much tied to performing the action itself following the present desire or preference in the given moment. One might wonder, for example, how the compatibilist might respond to choices which are being made from a position of desire in the moment, yet do not reflect what the person thinks or feels he or she should do in a more normative sense. One might take here the example of eating a piece of chocolate cake, where one makes the choice based upon immediate desire, yet the reflection on this choice in terms of what one wishes to do is to not eat the piece of cake. Perhaps one is trying to lose weight or has not checked the ingredient list for possible allergens. The last two branches both concern a lack of free will. The most extreme of these in many ways is the position of hard indeterminism, which denies both that the universe operates according to deterministic laws or determinism, as well as the position that free will exists. This might seem confusing, especially since holders of libertarian free will will also deny determinism, but hard indeterminism makes the claim that it simply does not follow from the fact that the universe is not determined to human free will being perfectly feasible. One could come across descriptions, for example, like those given by the highly successful enterprise of quantum mechanics, which gives rise to indeterminacy, which we might in turn try to describe in a probabilistic fashion, or that of in non-linear dynamics, which gives rise to chaotic states. The point here being is that if the universe is composed of randomness, then how will actions being composed of randomness and luck give rise to free choice? We may then say that hard indeterminism states the case that indeterminism is incompatible with the sufficient freedom of control as taken by the proponents of free will. However, some advocates of free will might respond by pointing out that undetermined events may still be caused and make an appeal for non-deterministic causation, so it is not enough for the hard indeterminists to wave away the positive claims coming from the free will camp in reference to causation by stating that causation must entail necessitation and this is not to be found within an indeterminacy system of luck and chance. Finally, the last branch in the more commonly held form of denial of free will found within hard determinism claims that events are caused by antecedent events from deterministic laws which in turn entails that free will does not exist. This is not to be confused with fatalism, which claims that any event is destined to occur no matter what action we take, but for the determinist, the person will typically advocate for a world governed by deterministic laws without involving the invocation of any event being fated to occur or any other mystical prediction destined to come true. The position instead rests upon an intuitive notion for many, which is to quote, if the world is governed by or as under the sway of determinism, if and only if, given a specified way things are at time t, the way things go thereafter is fixed as a matter of natural law. Challenges for this position will involve giving a proper justification for the overarching role that deterministic law plays in this theory. If, for instance, it turns out that most scientific theories are stated in terms of probability rather than brute definitive facts, then the conclusions drawn, one can argue, will be similarly probable in nature but not necessarily absolutely necessary. That sums up the four mainstream branches concerning free will. It should be noted, due to the technical jargon of philosophy, that there exist more divisions than the ones we have gone through, especially if we consider subdivisions of determinisms, things can really get out of hand. But I feel although that the selection here made should encompass the most commonly held positions taken concerning the study of free will. Right, so it might be useful here to, uh, to give an analogy essentially of the four different positions which we've seen concerning the free will problem. 
We can imagine, for instance, a rocket ship that has to deliver some cargo to a planet, let's call it Planet X, and in order to do so, this rocket ship has to reverse this difficult path of asteroids, essentially, in its way. Now, in the first scenario, we might imagine the rocket only having, like, some crude measurement device in terms of giving the highest density fields of the asteroids, but essentially each time the rocket goes through a high density field or with some path concerning asteroids, you won't know how the ship will react. There is a certain uncertainty and there is not a determinism, a complete determinism in controlling the exact path it's going to follow, so we might invoke here the free will scenario, if you will. And in the second scenario, we can imagine the the same event happening, essentially, but let's say that the the system is, is again, non-deterministic and very chaotic, and it's in this position that we can't even uh, determine where it's going to uh, act, this, this rocket ship, and uh, it, there's a lack of free will element here, if you will, even though there's a non-determinism at play, which uh, coincides with this uh, strong indeterminism case. So just because there's indeterminacy doesn't mean that we get free will in the scenario for a rocket ship. And in the third scenario, we can imagine uh, hard determinism kicking in, if you will, where we know exactly the path which the rocket is going to take. We know exactly how it's going to navigate through the asteroid field. And each time there's an incoming asteroid, we, we can predict or we can say in advancement how in terms of how it's going to navigate perfectly through the field. And finally, with the compatibilist position, it's, we're still going to be able to determine exactly the path of the rocket through planet X, but there is an indeterminacy at play when, when the asteroid comes uh, into the vantage point, perhaps, of the rocket ship. We don't know exactly in which direction it's going to sway, so there's still some free, el free will element, if you will, in this last scenario. It might also be interesting here to say a few words about the types of or the categories of choices we we talk about when we're talking about free will, uh, what kind of choices we're talking about. Like uh, it might be uh, very often these more uh, important decision-making problems which come up. Not not so much these more trivial. You know, am I really free to watch movie A instead of movie B? But more of these. Uh, hard-hitting questions, perhaps. A famous example would be the one given by Jean-Paul Sartre, perhaps, when he discusses the teenager who either has to make the choice between staying at home, essentially, with his his mom to take care of her, or he is going to enlist in the army and follow more, or not a more, but a, another noble pursuit, if you will. We might also mention here that um, how we view natural laws or how we view the universe or our metaphysics also comes into play as we've seen in terms of the free will question. If we have a very uh, view, a very rigid view based on scientific realism or determinism that's going to affect our view perhaps of, of the free will question itself, which is interesting. Uh, relegates the, the famous quote by Schopenhauer that man does what he does but he, he does not will what he wills. And uh, lastly, maybe we could talk about the, the, the project itself of determining free will, or at least the philosophical project about concerning about how really how much progress has been made in, in this endeavor. Because it seems to me that there hasn't been much progress. And uh, even if you're going to tie free will very much in terms of neuroscience, well, neuroscience is very much in its infancy stage, if you will, scientifically as well. And there are proponents... Uh, defending views as well from a, a scientific view as well in, in regards to the literature. So there's no free ticket in, in that regards. And even back to when we're talking about the different choices, there are certainly like automatic processes like when driving a car, you can imagine you're making these sort of uh, decisions based on intuition or before you react to them. Well, proponents of free will are many of them at least, such as Robert Kane, for example, he's very willing to go along with this scenario. For him, it's it's not important, these these types of scenarios, you, you might say, in that regard. So it matters what kind of questions we're asking or what kind of scenarios we're asking when we're discussing free will. And it also seems to me like a lot of the arguments going back and forth in the philosophical camp are very linguistic in nature as well, and it's, it's not clear to me that there are uh, really strong advancements in the terms of arguments coming in at play.
Now, to delve into Epicurus and his advocacy of free will, we might begin with the caveat that although many people have historically written about his philosophy, very few sources survive that can be directly attributed to Epicurus himself, so we should always keep in mind this when making inferences concerning his school of philosophy. And this is not from a lack of output in any way, as Epicurus was regarded as a very voluminous writer in his day. We can begin by noting, as we start, that it is an interesting fact that Epicurus takes the positive position in regards to free will, when we consider the fact that Epicurus and Epicureans in general are materialists, taking only bodies and space to exist, where much influence of this school has been extracted from the work of Democritus. We might from this posit that Epicureans should be partial, perhaps, to determinism, acting as a strong mechanism on free will, very much like atomic motion, being determined by previous states determining the path of an object under exertion of a force. This is commonly referred to and discussed in modern literature as causal determination, which dictates that the laws of nature with past states of the universe give rise to exactly one future. The Epicurean philosopher Lucretius notes, however, that while adhering to the former description of moving forces, nonetheless states that it cannot possibly be the case that free will is fully determined by preceding events, as in opposition to bodies being manipulated according to past events, free volition thereby allows for each of us to move according to our own in-tuned personal fashion. Likewise, Epicurus denies determinism to be true and takes issue with this aspect of Democritus to quote, Epicurus appropriates most of his metaphysics from Democritus. Like Democritus, he identifies the mind with a conglomerate of atoms. However, he recognizes that Democritus' atomism has unacceptable deterministic consequences. If all atomic motions are causally necessitated, then our decisions, being identified with atomic motions in our minds, would likewise be causally necessary. And if this were true, we would not have the ability to do otherwise than is necessary for moral responsibility. Epicurus therefore denies determinism and posits instead that there is an existence, a swerve as he calls it, which makes free will true. This swerve will serve as the key differing factor allowing for free will, and likewise uses the theory of atoms so dear to Epicurean metaphysics in its justification. The swerve is an indeterministic atom motion whereby our volition will ultimately give rise to an action or a set of actions which are fundamentally constituted by an indeterministic atomic motion. Freedom of action is thus made possible by making an appeal to these swerves, which serve to allow for different actions according to different volitional states producing swerves at different time junctions or not appearing at all. This argument might seem to hold topical value in many ways when we take into consideration that it has not at current been determined if the brain works according to a quantum mechanical framework for consciousness where classical mechanics alone is an insufficient explanation. One could thus allow for chaotic systems or chaotic dynamics in the brain as giving rise to a framework of free will very much analogous perhaps to a motion of indeterminacy at the atomic level. I will not go into further details here on this theory, but it has been formulated as a quantum brain hypothesis, where I have left a link in the description for those more interested in this theory statement and its critique. In any case, as Epicurus believes actions to be caused by our own volition, he must hold that we are morally accountable for our actions, and much of what he believes is under threat then by, in terms of moral responsibility, itself if determinism were true. In any case, as Epicurus believes actions to be caused by our own volition, he must hold that we are morally accountable for our actions, and much of what he believes then is under threat if moral responsibility itself were thrown out the window and determinism were true. In addition, we might also see free will in relation to Epicurean hedonism, which is characterized by acting in such a way in order to attain pleasure or the goal of nature, in which if determinism were true, then these choices would not be characterized by the necessary freedom which Epicureans adhere to. Having given a brief overview of the position Epicurus takes in regards to free will, 
as well as stating what is under threat from determinism, we will further explore arguments in favor of this position, as well as offering critiques in the next video. Epicurus is obviously going to come against difficulties if we examine more clearly in what sense our actions are deemed to be under our control, as well as the notion that if the swerving mechanism is characterized by random events in the brain, how is it then that if you could have willed a free voluntary action into existence if these conditions were true?